We are back, Golenbach University. I'm Ralph Teco with the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network, one of the three baseball Meshuganas, along with Alan Blumpkin, who is here. Al, how are you, sir? Okay. And the third most uh, prestigious of us all, I must say, Professor Golenbach of Golenbach University. You've joined us this evening, and uh, we're grateful. How are you, sir? I'm I'm just fine. I've returned from the trop, uh, Tropicana Field in lovely St. Petersburg, Florida, where the right. St. Petersburg Rays, known as the Tampa Bay Rays, uh, proceeded to defeat the uh, mighty Boston Red Sox three games out of four, uh, defeating out of them three former Cy Young Award winners. Whoa, that's quite a weekend. Whoa. It was quite a weekend. Nice. It was stunning. It was like the World Series. It really was. It, it was just fantastic. Uh, nice. People don't realize it because nobody's really paying much attention to the Tampa Bay Rays. But we have put together a championship club. We now have one of the finest shortstops in the game in the Daney Pechevaria, who is absolutely – the last shortstop, as good as this guy, um, was a little guy who played for the St. Louis Cardinals way back when. That's how good. That's how good Echeverry is. Wow, he's just. Are you talking about Ozzie Smith? Yeah, that's who I'm talking. Or, or his replacement. Um, oh man, is that his name just flew? flew no, I was talking about Ozzie Smith. And the other guy right. we have, and I don't know how we got him. It was amazing. A fellow by the name of Wilson Ramos, who was our catcher, who used to be the catcher for the Washington Nationals before he seriously injured his leg. At any rate, he's back, and he is, I would say he and Mr. Posey are probably the two best catchers in baseball. So oh, us little Tampa Bay Some Bay high Bay. praise for the young man because Posey yes. is a, yes. a Hall of Famer waiting to happen. He no could question hang about it. Up tomorrow, five years he's in. We also, the Rays also have the player who was taken in the draft right before Posey. Tim really? Beckham. Tim Beckham. Yes, the Rays uh, and all their uh, whatever the opposite of smarts is decided that they couldn't afford Mr. Posey, and so they took Tim Beckham first, and and for the first time. In five years, Tim Beckham has actually turned out to pretty damn, be a pretty damn good ball player. He said something like 10 home runs. He's driven in 40 runs, uh, playing a great – he was playing shortstop, and now that we've got Hetcheveria, he's now playing second base. And uh, he's instrumental. He's doing, he's doing a tremendous job. Uh, good. May I ask you both whether or not baseball has fixed that so that draft choices are slotted for a certain amount of salary now – and um, it doesn't matter who you choose for signability, you're still going to have to pay him X amount of dollars based on his position being drafted. Is that new, or have they done that yet? Um, is it in That's the what they're doing now. Yes. That's what they're doing now. The Rays just drafted this fabulous player out of the University of Louisville. He was rated the number one player in college ball. He is both a pitcher – and uh, uh, I think he plays first base as his other position, and a tremendous, tremendous hitter. And, in fact, what they're going to do is something really, really interesting. They're going to allow him, at least his first year in the minor leagues, to do what Babe Ruth did back in 1916, which is to say pitch every five days and on the days when he's not pitching to play in the field. Did Babe Ruth ever do that? Did he oh, play yeah. in the field? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, I didn't nice. realize that. I thought he was just a pitcher for Boston. 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 The, the, the transitions from the transition from a uh, uh, full-time pitcher to hitter, I think 1918 was the first year he did that. That's right. Okay, and then uh, 1919 it became, this last year with Boston, it became more pronounced that the, by the time he right. got to the Yankees, uh, he was exclusive. Became almost exclusively a, a hitter. Right. With Boston, Ed Barrow was the manager of Boston. Yeah. 
And uh, Barrow and he were fighting all the damn time. Yeah. Um, and and so it was Barrow who insisted that Ruth continue to pitch because, quite frankly, he was a Hall of Fame pitcher. Yeah. If you look at, at Ruth's record, it was something like 93 and 33. I mean, he had an amazing, amazing pitching record before he became Babe Ruth. Um, right. And Barrow, Barrow needed him in the rotation. And finally they got a couple more pitchers. Uh, so that Ruth was able to sort of wean his way uh, from from pitcher to being first a first baseman, and then he became uh, the outfielder that he was going to become with the Yankees. But this did kid, Ruth ever miss pitching? Did he ever speculate uh, um, about you know his career if he he would have? No, but I'll tell you a very interesting story. Uh, I interviewed many years ago. The fellow who was the trainer, Ed Froelich was his name. God, how I remember that, I have no idea. So I interviewed Ed Froelich, who was the trainer for the McCarthy Yankees. And he was also the trainer for the Brooklyn Dodgers when Ruth was a coach with the Brooklyn Dodgers with Leo DeRocher as manager of the Dodgers. So he got wow. to do several things. He got to have a discussion with Ruth, for instance, whether Ruth actually called his shot. And I have the conversation where Ruth said to Froelich, are you out of your mind? Do you think that I would have pointed to center field with Charlie Root on the mound? You would have taken my friggin' head off. <laughs> and what happened, what happened, of course, was that the Cubs were screaming at him. Ruth had called him the Cubs a cheapskate because – uh, Mark Koenig, the Yankee shortstop, had gone over to Chicago, and after Koenig helped them win the pennant in 1927, the Pirates only gave him a third share of the World Series winnings. And Ruth was furious. Ruth was a good friend of Koenig's and thought the Pirates were cheapskates and called them every name in the book. You mean the Cubs? Cubs, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, not Cubs. Sorry, two Cubs. Yeah, yeah, the Cubs. Cubs uh, in 1932. Don't say the Pirates point. and bad things yeah. around Al Bluff. <laughs> yeah, this, I'm sorry, that's the Cubs in 1932. Right. Um, he, knows and, where, and, he knows where you are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, so, and, so, uh, and, and so he was pointing into the dugout when somebody thought he was pointing to center field. Uh, there's an interesting film of it. There's actually a Magru Magruder film of, of Ruth pointing and it's pretty clear to me that he was pointing to the dugout. Also, um, there was a very fine photographer uh, by the name of Burke. Uh, I can't remember his first name, but he took photos. He was out of Chicago, and he took photos of everybody. And I used to have, you know, a whole string of Burke photos. They were great. At any rate, when I went to see Mr. Burke, he was 92 years old. Uh, he had published the book, and I bought his book, and I wanted him to sign it for me. And I asked him the same question because he was in the photographer's booth uh, in Chicago in 1932 when Ruth called the shot. And he wrote it out for me in the book that absolutely in no way did Babe Ruth call his shot, that that was absolute nonsense, that Ruth was pointing into the dugout screaming at the Cubs for being <laughs> cheapskates. So, right. so that's a long way about describing the Rays' number one draft choice right now. Uh, but I think it's interesting because if they give this kid uh, a chance to do it, obviously, if he could pitch every five days and play the field the other four, can you imagine how that's going to change baseball? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And there have been three or four players. Rich Ankeel was one. Uh, I think Ben McDonald might, might have been a, another who were just skilled at, at both. Yeah. And I don't. Um, oh, Smokey Joe Wood became a uh, an outfielder after his arm went bad. He did and hit three sixty one, I think, yeah. one year with the that, yeah. Cleveland. No, that's, that's as that's, did Stan Musial after his arm went bad. Stan Musial. Stan Musial was a pitcher in the minors, and right. it was interesting about Musial because his manager was Dickie Kerr. Now, I don't know if that need, name means anything to you. Oh, yes, yeah, in the uh, New York Giants shortstop. In, am I well, no, no. No, 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 no. In the 1919 World Series, this, this, Kerr, this, this, this Kerr was the only White Sox pitcher, I believe, to win any games. Or no, let's put it this he way. Won he won two out of three. At least, he won at two least, out of three, right. At least Anyhow, won the other one, won game not. seven, because Eddie Sakat 
got uh, pissed off at that guy. Right. Or exactly. Decided. So, decided but I won the other two games. Yeah. And he was banned Kirk- from ba- by by Landis uh, because he uh, didn't like the salary offer, and he he left to do something else. Heard it. Banned from Lamp- by Landis for a while. Yeah. Well, Landis was. That's a whole yeah, other story. That, yeah. But anyhow, Kerr was the manager yeah. for Stan Musial when he was the pitcher and he hurt himself. And it was Kerr who suggested that Musial was such a good hitter that he go to first base and learn, you know, to be a position player. And, and of course, as they say, the rest is history. Yes. An amazing stat. The same amount of hits um, away and home. No, he used to um, the Dodgers up in Ebbets Field. Yep. Yeah, they gave him the nickname The Man. The man, right. the man. Here comes that man. Yeah, here comes yep. that man again, yeah. That's right. He used to That's kill that. Um, I'll t- tell you a very cute, quick story. Shea Stadium, first year they opened was Musial's last year. Now, and the rumor was... Now he, the rumor was... 64. 63 was his last year. Oh, so then it must have been the Polo Grounds. Yeah. Okay. Because I went out with my... Then girlfriend, I was like 15, 16 year, years old, and we got good seats to see the Cardinals right behind the dugout. And um, as he's coming in, she says, Stan Musial, fantastic. And he just looks at her and goes, you're pretty fantastic yourself, young lady. <laughs> you walk in. in a nice way. Not, oh, absolutely. In a nice way, not a, sure. not a, a you know, um, malicious way or nasty. He just said it with kind of a smile. You're pretty fantastic yourself, young lady. Well, he's like Yogi. Not that I ever had anything bad to say about Stan Musial. Right. I, um, yeah. There was that one. Thing, and I think it might have been Kurt Flood's book about some mix-up. He owned a restaurant called Biggie's, and it was obviously in the heart of St. Louis. It was, and one of the players, it might have been Flood, came in and seemed to have some problems um, getting seated, one of the, the black players. Um, and But uh, turns out Musial wasn't there. He was basically a front. He had a, I think he got off scot-free on that racial thing. Can you elaborate on that, Peter? Well, I can just tell you that the Kurt Flood story is one of the really absolute strangest stories I've ever run across. Um, he was the commissioner of the senior league during the first year that we had our wonderful senior league. So I got to talk to him a little bit. He was a very quiet guy. He seemed very, very nice. But after he died, some very, very strange things came to light. For instance, it was said that Kurt Flood was this fabulous painter where where he had, you know, made his money by going to Amsterdam after he left baseball and becoming this fabulous painter. And he sold paintings. He sold paintings for a living. It turned out, in fact, the man never, ever painted a single painting. I don't know where he got the paintings that he sold, but he didn't sell them. Very, 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 very strange. He was was just a very strange guy. Yeah. Had, Had a a sense of himself enough to know that he wasn't going to be, he wasn't going to go to a city that wasn't going to accept him. And, um, you know, without it, because I think it was Washington, if I'm not mistaken. And D.C. is kind of a border uh, well, city. Well, he wouldn't accept the trade to Philly. No, the, Philly, oh, the trade okay. was to Philadelphia. Yeah. But, okay, but it, wouldn't have mattered, the, it wouldn't have mattered where the trade was going to be go to he didn't want to leave and the interesting thing is and I talked to Marvin Miller about this a couple times for a couple reasons and and Marvin told him point blank if you go through with this you're not going to win you're just not going to win but Kurt had it in his head that 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 you know that it wasn't fair sort of like Muhammad Ali except the difference was that Muhammad Ali won his his uh, Supreme Court case 
and he was allowed to, you know, to be a conscientious objector and not go to the war. Right. Herb Flood lost his case. He lost that case, and 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 it's interesting because obviously it was the first you know shot across the bow in the players' attempt to take that reserve clause away and and for the players to become ultimately free agents. Well, I put it in the five rule because because of them where you know the ten, ten year veterans five years with the same team. Well, that's what that's, that's what that's what better, Marvin. Because that, of flood, flood, yeah. Well, that's what Marvin came up with. I mean, yeah. Marvin was so much smarter than everybody else. And what Marvin wanted to do is he knew that once, after Messersmith and McNally declared that they were playing the season without signing a contract, and they were paid by their ball clubs without signing a contract, so that at the end of the season they went to arbitration. Uh, which Marvin Miller had set up. So it was a three-man arbitration, uh, a player, a, a, an arbitrator from the owners, an arbitrator from the players, and a third guy who was neutral. And this guy was named Peter Seitz. And they went to these arbitrators, and he was voted on, on a, you know, a two-to-one vote that the reserve clause was dead, that one year meant one year, and that everybody was free. So Marvin the brilliant, brilliant man that he was, knew that if you freed everybody, if everybody was free, that the prices of most of these guys would not skyrocket because of supply and demand. So he came up with this fabulous notion of 5 and 10. You know, if you're in the league 10 years and you're with a club for five years, you know, at the end of that time you become free. So who became free? Only the greats. The greats became free. Uh, uh, Reggie Jackson was one, the, the great outfielder for the Oakland A's, uh, left fielder. He became one. A bunch of pitchers. Joe Rudy. Joe Rudy, that's who I'm talking about. A bunch of pitchers who were very, very good became free. And almost every one of those guys ended up with contracts, $1 million, $2 million, $3 million, setting, you know, setting the stage, setting the price. Right. And Whereas, you know, the irony is that yeah. the guy that made the biggest splash was Tom Seaver, and his what his was just an error by Finley. Who no, not Seaver. I'm sorry, Catfish Hunter. Pay. Catfish Hunter. Catfish Hunter. Uh, Catfish did I, Hunter. Who did I say? Yeah, you said Seaver. Catfish Hunter oh, was I'm the guy. Sorry. Catfish. I, I was just about to um, talk about him. Yes, that was that was that was Charlie Finley's stubbornness and stupidity because Catfish Hunter had a contract with Finley whereas half his money was supposed to go into an annuity because Catfish was a guy who wanted to have money left over when he retired. He was a very smart guy financially. And for some reason, Charlie Finley didn't pay him, did not pay his money into his annuity. And for some reason, he just... And he was an insurance man, which makes... It, it was so bizarre. Work. Finley was a son of a bitch. And he was just determined that, screw you, I'm not going to do it. And but so, no, I, so, I think that was an I think that was an error. I I don't think he didn't pay the annuity thing. He wasn't happy about paying anybody those, those outrageous salaries. He was dealing everybody. So where was the error? Where was the error? The error was that he failed to make an annuity a, a contractual agreement to make to put to make a payment into that annuity. Okay. And well, the, so the bottom line is he didn't do it. Yeah, he didn't do and it. So, and, so Catfish, and, Catfish went, uh, went to, to arbitration once again, and he was declared a free agent, which was amazing. It was just the most amazing thing when Catfish was right. declared a free agent because there was Catfish and there was Jim Palmer, and they were the two kings that ruled the roost. And so when he became a free agent, you know, one of the smartest things, one of the smarter things that George Steinbrenner did do was to sign Catfish Hunter to the Yankees because that showed Yankee fans that he was really serious about wanting to win. Well, and by God, Catfish. Before that, uh, Finley, uh, in a fit, a fit released uh, Ken Harrelson. Mm hmm. Oh, yeah, way back. In, in well, Finley, uh, Finley did a bunch of stupid things. 57, and then uh, there was. Uh, 
uh, you know, for, for that time, it, it was a substantial bidding for uh, house services. He wound up signing with Boston. Right. And that, that very had, good. Uh, and with the, the Hunter, Hunter situation, that just so, showed uh, a lot of players what was out there. Right. Okay. It certainly, and then, uh, certainly, yeah, certainly did. But Finley really right. helped. And just as soon as, uh, you know, after 1976, uh, all of them, except by a blue, who was still tied to them contractually, all of them left. Well, what happened, and, and I'll never forget this. This was the summer of 19, I think, 77. I was working at the Bergen Record, and all of a sudden it was announced that Charlie Finley had sold three players. Uh, Vita Blue to the Yankees. Oh, 76, Peter, because... 76, uh, okay, 76. Uh, Fingers and, and Rudy left after 76. Okay, Fingers and yeah, Rudy. To Boston. To Boston, yeah. and who went to the Yankees? Vita Blue. Vita Blue went to the Yankees. He's selling each of these guys for, you know, like a million dollars each cash. Because Finley, and sure my God... In and, and I saw... Well, let me tell you, let me tell you the story. Tell you the story. I mean, right. they, they, I was working on the copy desk. And I had written Dynasty, so they knew I knew something about the Yankees. So they said, listen, look what happened. The Boston Red Sox bought these guys. The Yankees are buying this guy. It should be a front-page paper, uh, article for the Bergen record. I want you to write it. So I spent the next couple hours writing this fabulous article about how the sales of these players were going to change baseball. So <laughs> write this article. comes out the next morning. It's sitting there on the newspaper. And the next day, Bowie Kuhn cancels all the sales, making my article <laughs> just moot. <laughs> well, actually, making it, if people have a copy of that article, it, it's actually like Dewey beats Truman. In it, well, very right? much like that, yes. My Dewey beats Truman article. Exactly <laughs> right. But okay. Bowie was an interesting guy. Bowie ne never made a correct decision in his entire commissionership. Never. <laughs> Bowie was such an idiot. He was an absolute idiot, and Marvin Miller made him look sick. Marvin Miller, Marvin Miller once said to me, "I can't believe what a dope this guy is, or was. Uh, he, just, he, he just, he just couldn't believe how short-sighted Kuhn and the baseball owners were." But of course, the the the, the part of it that you know that Marvin never would say is. You can't believe what a brilliant, brilliant guy I was, because he was. Right. He was well, smarter. Was he was. Dope. He was dope. smarter than all of them. You've associated yourself with a bunch of smart people. Uh, your fellow Dartmouth uh, political. Uh, well, wow, political Robert scientist. Wright, the smartest man I know. Absolutely. Smarter he than, was the, than Mil I'll ask you this: smarter than Miller? Close. Ooh, that's it's close. It's damn I watched close. Robert Reich on the on, on the Facebook on the resistance report. Uh, they uh -huh. were doing about the, our beloved elected president. Yes, yes, yeah. Robert Reich should be our president. I always thought, you know, he he was so eloquent. Um, you know, at Dartmouth when I was there, he was the head of the student body. Um, a remarkable, remarkable human being. Consider the fact that he's four foot ten. You know, he's a very, very short, short person. But he's as an intellect, like, yeah, that's um, short. Wow. Yeah, that's yeah, short. As an intellect, right. he's about 11 feet tall. So, so he certainly yeah. made up for it with that. He and Trump, uh, uh, the birthdays were very close. Yeah, well. I looked that up uh, when I started watching, uh, you know, Robert Reich's resistance report on, uh, you know, uh, on Trump. Yep. Yeah. Sure. Well, he, um. What do you think, guys? And this is off baseball. What do you think of Trump's trip? No, I'm not talking to about Russia. Trump. I'm not talking about well, Trump. Sorry. Well, basically, I think all these foreign leaders got a good sense of him, and they can play him like a violin or like a drum. Okay. You know, anytime anybody flatters him, I think the the epitome of that was when he went to Saudi Arabia. And they fly oh, him. Right. Anybody who flies him, you know, yeah. he, he, he walks. Yeah. So well, they, they let's can, end they the, can, the, the... They can play uh, him like a drum. 
we could end the whole surreal political situation in the world by just saying and bringing everybody's attention, Saudi Arabia is not only our ally, but they're on the the Human Rights Commission at the UN. <laughs> oh, yeah. They have four well, things. I mean, considering after 9-11, all the people responsible were from Saudi Arabia. Uh, and, then, of course, you, you know. If a woman he smokes a cigarette, she, has, she ends up yeah. with no head. He, he, he yeah, gives them a multi-billion dollar arms deal. I think what we ought to do right now is, is talk about how wonderful on Tuesday is going to be this incredible all-star game. And, uh, you know, wish wish all you baseball fans out there a wonderful week. Uh, hey, a sorry quick word on Doug Harvey, because I understand he's been ill. He's He's uh, been ill since I did that book, and that was three, four years ago. The man is amazing. He had terminal cancer when we were doing the book. Whoa. Uh, you know, Wendy and I were supposed to meet him at uh, Cooperstown uh, after the book came out. And he was too ill to go to Cooperstown. And the man is hanging in there. He is one yes. tough guy. He is just one tough guy. Love him. What possessed you to though? write a book on an umpire? Because the way I'm thinking, he has to be special because nobody's going to have a natural rooting in interest. Like, say I'm a Mets fan and you write a book on Dykstra and yeah. Or Mookie Wilson, right? Yeah. There's an, but nobody loves an umpire. The best you could say is that they don't hate him; that he, they're neutral. So well, what? What there, was there's the, actually the hook? there's actually a history of umpire books. There have been you know okay. five or six very successful umpire books in the last twenty years. Oh. Um. Who was the umpire who told all the great jokes? He told. He must have written two or three books. You know, I can't Luciano. remember the names right. What's Ron his name? Luciano. Yeah, Ron Luciano. Yeah, yeah. I have he wrote a book. a book called. He wrote a book called The Umpire Strikes Back, which is hilarious. Yeah. I have a it's, book called. You know, The Empire Jocko. Strikes Back. The Umpire Strikes Back. I have a book um, called Jocko about uh, the umpire. Yeah, well, that that was a biography, wasn't it? Or was it an oil biography? biography? Yeah, Jocko Conlon. Uh, very, very. Sure. I enjoy it very much. Sure. Well, yeah, just Doug, the, Doug just was the number one the umpire. Yeah. Hmm? One thing Jack go? O'Connor said was that uh, you can call me anything, but never call me a DeRocher. It's the lowest form of life. That's funny. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I we had to ask you how yeah. DeRocher, uh, how Babe Ruth oh, could that, that coach the Leo DeRocher after it was alleged that uh, Leo DeRocher stole his watch. Um, they had to hate each other. Uh, well, the, 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 yeah, the the the, the uh, trainer of the Brooklyn Dodgers at the time, who used to work for McCarthy, was there when Ruth was the coach and DeRocher was the manager. And DeRocher basically called him your big bum. You know, basically you're only there to draw. He, he would taunt Babe Ruth. Uh, DeRocher was a, a very nasty kind of a guy. Uh, oh yeah, he he would taunt Ruth by saying you're only here because they want you to um, you know to draw fans. Oh, let me go back to the story that I wanted to tell you about 20 minutes ago. A um, couple of the players on the Brooklyn Dodgers said to Ruth, "I understand you were a pitcher when you started. Uh, can you still pitch?" And Ruth hadn't pitched in 20 years, but he said to them, I, I suspect that I still can. And the next day they went out at batting practice, and Ruth pitched. And these guys, who are, you know, Dodger major leaguers, uh, were just amazed at his speed, at his, at his uh, you know, control, at his ability to throw a great curve. You know, Babe Ruth at age, what, 40, uh, he could still bring it. And they, they were just amazed by that. That was one of the stories that, that, that Froelich told me about his time uh, with Ruth and DeRocher. Um, also, there was a time where the two of them got into a fistfight, DeRocher and Ruth. And, and When he was he, coaching and managing? When, and when DeRocher was managing and Ruth was, was one of the coaches. Yeah. Whoa. Oh, yeah. And, and shortly after that fistfight, they let Ruth go. 
the rusher was a nasty guy, but he was a, he was like Billy Martin. He was a magnificent manager. Yeah, um, for a winner, he didn't take a t- do too well with losers. No, he, he no, lost he didn't. no, he, he didn't. lost interest quickly. And no, I think Al has mentioned how he screwed up the Cubs. Um, yeah, well, you know, he was 65 years old by at that point. You know, game had passed him by to some extent. He well, he was a guy in 69 that. with the Cubs. He decided he was going to play their eight every starters time, every yeah. single game. And by September, right. all these guys, you know, uh, I, I went to a Cubs fantasy camp and talked to Santo about that at great length. And he said that by September, we were just exhausted. You know, and they didn't have people, you know, they didn't have the subs to, to, to take their place. And, the, and they had no, just, uh, there were no uh, lights there at that point. So, and uh, there were no lights, and the, yeah. and the whole thing just collapsed. Well, the Rosa, the Rosa said the biggest mistake he ever made as a manager was uh, not going out to uh, – Hugh Casey, after Mickey Owen uh, missed that third strike in the 41 World Series, and uh-huh. because Casey completely unraveled the Yankees, went yep. getting four runs and uh, winning that game. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. All right, boys. Hey, time for me. Of that time fantasy for me to camp, I will wrap never up. forget the Jimmy Pearsall story. Yeah, uh, Jimmy as Pearsall. Long, yep. <laughs> as long as I live. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, any one thing about Doug Harvey that um, really impressed you or is indelible in your Well, it was funny. They called they called him God. He was he was tall. He was handsome. He was imperious, and he's very rarely wrong. And they called him God. And we had long arguments because I wanted to call the title of the book. They called me God, and I finally won that. I'm glad I yes, did. You did. I, I, yeah. Yeah, I'm glad I did. Um, um, he thought that that was bragging. I said, no, it's oh. not bragging. It's what they called you. He, he was. A, he still is a one. I'm sure he's still a wonderful man. He just, I love that guy. He was great. Good. Um, boy, you, you know, for the most part, you've enjoyed the books you've written. You've enjoyed writing the books you've written. Uh, well, that's, that's that's the most fun. That's the part of it. The are there any fabulous? books that, is there any of your books that once you got into it, you're into it, a contractual this, that, and the other thing, and all of a sudden you're not enjoying it? Well, I, I can give you a whole hour on, on people who cheated me. You know, I, I got oh. cheated by Paul Horning, I got cheated by Lenny Dykstra. Um, but and in terms of writing the book, um, I didn't know. No, I, I, people are just interesting. Even 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 sort of conniving people are interesting. So 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 you know my job is to uh, make the other person you know the most interesting person that that person can be, and that's that's what I do. Yeah. And I love doing it. You know, you I'm, put Horning and Rose together. They both had. Not, not Rose. Campus. Not Rose. Did I say Rose? I didn't say Rose. Not Rose. That, Horning. No, Horning. Dystra. And Dystra. Horning and Dykstra. They both had serious gambling problems. Do you think that if they, if that weren't, if gambling and money management weren't their um, their devil, uh, their demon, that knowing them, they may not have cheated you? If that were, is well, that I know Horning cheated me because he was in financial trouble at the time. He needed the money. So right. the easiest thing okay, for, me to that, do, for that, him to do is steal away from me. Uh, Dykstra did it because he's just – that's just his nature. He, he's just – he's okay. like Trump. He's like Trump. I mean, he's he's involved with more lawsuits than you can shake a stick at the way Trump is. And that's because uh, he's basically somebody with no morals. He's not born with morals. And so there's nothing okay. that he can do to you where he would say, gee, I really shouldn't have done that. You know, if, if he yeah. thinks he could get away with something, you know, stealing from you, he'll just do it. And he did it. Yep. Well, um, I don't even want to know about the other people that cheated you because that, you know, um, it just puts Horning's memory in my mind. It takes it down a peg or two, if not more. <sighs> That's all. I mean, the frustrating thing for me about the Horning thing 
is that I went to Louisville and we spent I spent two days with Paul, and he told me the most marvelous stories. We got a three hundred and seventy five thousand dollar advance for that book, and that was going to be my number one bestseller. It was going to be be called um, um, Golden Boy. We're going to call the book Golden Boy, and we're going to tell all the stories that he told me for the proposal. And he decided he wanted the money. So it was basically, you know, I'm taking all the money and the hell with you. And then he found somebody who lived next to him to actually write the book. And I've got the book here, and it's terrible. I mean, I don't understand why the publishing company allowed him to do that, if you want to know the truth. It's very, very strange, except, of course, Paul Horning is very famous, and uh, he he's a powerful, you know, guy. So he got his way, and the publisher ended up uh, eating a lot of money. It was a and big story when he and Karras yeah. were suspended. I think it must have been around 1960. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. You know, considering what some what other people were doing at the time, it was small potatoes. But uh, Roselle at the time wanted to make an example of the two of them, and he did. You know, I'm not sure if if the gambling that was going on was lessened by any. Um, as I said, Horning told me stories that were just unbelievable about people gambling. Really? Yeah. Yep. One last uh, thing I want to mention off topic. Uh huh. The old sports radio station here, WFAN, this yep. week is going to audition for a replacement for Mike Francesa. Maybe Trump will take it. No, you're close. The one that they're auditioning is Fatso from New Jersey. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. Perfect. Oh, my God. Hey, Perfect. Hey, I just, hey, uh, I just him. realized who you meant. Hey, hi, the, him. I'm the beach the whale. Room. Another talk show. The beach whale. Thing. Yeah. Well, uh. Francesca hated my guts ever since I wrote uh, Personal Fouls. Yeah. He was, a, he was a close friend of Jimmy V, of course. You know, two scoundrels. Um, you know, so I, there's no love lost between me and, and, and Mr. Mike. You bring it Chris Christie, got that crappy poll last week with the beach and uh, yep. everything else. Oh yeah, yeah. So I mean, the, 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 the reward this guy. I mean, it's just it's, it's beyond. Confidence. Peter, send him a dough. Tell him you want the job. Wouldn't it be I want? I don't want the job. I don't want the job. I'm happy here in St. Petersburg. Well, you'd be in St. Petersburg. They do it in a studio in St. No, Petersburg. No. Well, you know, I had a show. I had a show I know, at WOR. W-O-R. Yeah. Yeah, I had a show, um, but but I don't know if you've noticed, but the rage today, especially on ESPN and on Fox, is to take two fillers, uh, you know, like Stephen A. Smith and, uh, you know, any one of seven or eight of these other guys and have them sit opposite each other and scream at each other. Yeah. You know, that is the new wave of of TV sports talk. And it was something back in 1980 that, that I, I sort of refused to do. I wanted an intellectual show where I would interview people and ask them, you know, intelligent questions. And I had, you know, wonderful people on my show. Um, but, you know, part so of what I. they wanted, they wanted, part of what they wanted is they <laughs> wanted me to take calls from the audience and talk to Jeff from Brooklyn and Joe oh, from God. Staten Island and do that for you know, 20, 30 minutes of the show. And, 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 and right now, half, would, of the, half of the calls are, you know, the Yankees should trade the, their stiff for some other team star. Well, that was I mean, yeah, that was a lot of it back then, too. But I know. I just, it's, just, it's just totally vapid. It's very hard to listen to. No, I, I know. I basically stopped. Well, that was my problem with, with yeah. talk radio. I, I, I didn't want to get involved in doing that. I think you made the right decision there. I hope so. Gentlemen, have a great week. You too. We'll see you soon. Take care. Okay. Thank you guys both, and uh, everybody out there, keep on keeping on. Uh, We'll see you Tuesday, Al. Okay. All right. Be well, everybody. Okay. You too. Bye-bye. Bye.